So in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 1, Wherefore, seeing we are, we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, wherefore all are partakers, then ye are bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had our fathers of the flesh, which have corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chasteneth us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness, whereunto them, unto them which are exercised thereby. Wherefore, lift up your hands which hang down, and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but rather let it be healed. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, and lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator, or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Uh, the second verse, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, if the Lord will help me tonight, I want to preach to you on looking unto Jesus or seeing the vision anew. If you would, stand, raise your hands, and ask God to help us tonight as we endeavor to preach the gospel. Our Father and our God, tonight we are standing before you. Lord, today we sense the urgent necessity of preaching the Word of God. Therefore, I pray tonight for that anointing of God that makes a man a New Testament prophet to settle on me for a while and touch the ears and the hearts of those that hear. Give us victory on the altar in Jesus' name. And the congregation said, Amen. Amen. Looking unto Jesus. Now, if it is, as we believe that it is, the last hour before midnight, if this is true, then we must have something more than we've got. We must have a spiritual awakening of all of God's people. I realize that we have showers of blessings. I, we, I realize we have isolated thunderstorms of glory. But the church of the firstborn by and large needs to be shaken out of her lethargic condition and awakened out of her soulish sleep and stirred again. We need, as the people of God, a new vision 
a fresh experience of the saving grace and keeping power of the Lord of glory through His Word and through the power of the Holy Ghost. We need it, church. Amen. Amen. It was with this thought and this burden and uh, as a pastor's heart, uh, I sought this message and I feel like the Lord spoke to me. It is an evident fact beyond dispute and argument that we need more than we've got. In spite of all the blessings and all the moving and all the shaking and all the stirring that we've had, you will still tell me I am not where I ought to be if you tell me the truth. When I read of my, when I compare my experience with the New Testament, I reward of God, I see that I need to have more than I've got. Amen. And then the question is, can I have it? And I must answer to me and you, yes. There can be an enrapturing, a soul awakening, a reviving, a re-energizing of every nerve ending in our spiritual bodies. There can be, yes, if there cannot be, the Bible is wrong. But it can only come by looking again unto Jesus. Amen. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Now, it is the indisputable law of nature, science, mathematics, physics. It's the law of gravity. And that is that the bigger it is, the more mass they are to it, the more pull is exerted by it. If we will make Jesus Christ what He is supposed to be, not only Savior, but Lord of our lives, if we'll make Him as big as He is, His pull toward us will be greater than the world. Amen. 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 You see, by looking unto Jesus, by beholding Him as the eternal victor, the exalted one, the spring of life, and the fountain of all strength. Uh, here where it says, looking unto Jesus. Uh, this word here is uh, it's a different kind of word. Looking unto Jesus. If you look unto Jesus... The way the apostle invites you to look unto Jesus, you've got to look unto Him by looking away from everything else. And this word here, it means, it has a double meaning in the original. It is looking away from those things which naturally catch the eye. Mm. If we are really going to look unto Jesus the way that we are stirred to look unto Him, there's a lot of things that naturally catch our eye and draw our attention that we're going to have to learn how to look away from. And that is the first meaning. It means looking beyond the circumstances, looking beyond the superficial, looking beyond the material. And then it means concentrating, concentrating our looking to those things which must be concentrated on to see. Now, don't go to sleep yet. You know, crank it up a little bit and listen to me. There's some things that can be found just walking down the road. There have been folks that have stumbled over a precious stone and picked it up in the road. 
There have been those who walked to the creek and put their hand in it and brought out a chunk of gold where many had only seen rocks. But the most precious mother load, the deep abundance of riches is found by those who concentrate, who dig deep, who survey, who bring their mind into captivity and their thoughts under subjection and think upon Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Jesus Christ is the center of our experience. And yet... We dare say we go days, and the only time we think about Him is when we use His name on the end of a prayer. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight, the besetting sin, and enter this race. Looking unto Jesus. Can I tell you that Christ, it is not dangerous. It is not. The devil will tell you that it's going to cost you tremendously to be in total subjection and submission to the Lord Jesus Christ. To follow His leading. To be in subjection unto His Spirit. But Jesus Christ never, ever disappoints His people. Now, when there's something, as as the preacher was talking about a while ago, that you really want to do, this is what you really, really want to do. And yet, in your heart of hearts, when you pray, you know it's not God's will. You know God will never put His blessing on it. But this is what I want. When you can look unto Jesus with that total, no way to distract from look, look, you will find out that Jesus Christ never disappoints. He only wonderfully, wonderfully surprises For when it seems like He has closed the door in this direction, it is only because He has a wonderful place for you in that direction. And it is when we are in total submission and given over to the Lord of glory, when we have gazed in His face and we have been transformed by His image, the thing we pray for and cry for and think we're going to die if we don't get. And it seems like the cop said no. And the devil jumps on you and says it's because that he is a mean God and, and he's selfish with you and, and this ain't fair. Oh, if you just wait. He never disappoints. He's got a surprise for you. Hey, man. Hey, man. Well, oh, God. All the blessings of God... Think about it. Have you ever thought about it? No, you ain't. You'd be a shot if you had them. All the blessings of God, every one of them, are so contrived, if I can use that word, that every blessing of God is so set up and God ordained it that way that, that, with, with the fulfillment of a blessing and uh, the deliverance of a increase at the same time there's always a promise of something better. Do you hear me? Every time you get one of God's blessings Every time, oh, the damage that's been done in the church by us who have been taught, saved, and sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, and satisfied. There is three definite works of grace, but there are a hundred thousand blessings afterwards. 
that you must go on to, that we must follow on after, that we must run in the race to apprehend. And every time you get a hold of a blessing of God and you obtain what you strive, have been striving after, right, with the very fulfillment, while you're shouting and while you're praising God and while you're enjoying it, there is a promise that come up higher, come up higher. There's more yet for you. The best is yet to come. Amen. The best is yet to come. Rick, turn to 2 Corinthians 3 and 18 while I'm talking. Every fulfillment of the promise at the same time offers something greater. Thus the best and most glorious is before us. And still to come. Is this over your head? Do you, are you not understand what I'm saying to you? I mean, you're sitting there like a bump on a pickle. And you're saying, bless God, I'm having the hardest time I've ever had in my life. And they ain't nothing to have but hard times and hard roads. And the devil, all you seen, all of you ain't seen Jesus in a week. But the devil's been there every day. You ain't lifted up your head high enough to see him, amen, who is over you. But you're lifting the devil around you, saying, hey, you can't take no more of this. You can't go no farther. You can't stand no more. When my God, friend, the Bible said the best is yet to come. Amen. Don't give me no testimonies of how it used to be. Don't tell me what Grandma had. Let me tell you what I'm fixing to do. Thank God for Grandma's day, but that won't help me in the battle I'm in right now. But what will help me is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 18. Read it loud, Rick. But we all with open face. But we all with open face. Beholding. Beholding. Looking unto. As in a glass. As in the glass. The glory. The glory. Of the Lord. Of the Lord. Are changed. We are what? Changed. We're changed. How do we get that? How do we get changed? What Paul say? We started the first read again, Rick. But we all with open face. With an open face. That means not being bashful about it. That means not being ashamed of it. That means coming bold to the throne of grace. That means walking up to it and looking into it to call with an all nothing hid, just as I am, Lord. Looking. Are changed into the same image. We're changed into what? The same image. From glory to glory. From glory to glory. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Change into what? Into a weak, cowing, scared, defeated Christian limping along. No! You ain't, you ain't looked him in the face. You ain't stared at him until you were transformed by it. You ain't looked at him. Amen. You ain't been on the mountain while you see Jesus. They got on the mount of transfiguration. They walked up there with Jesus. While he was walking, he began to be transformed before them. His garments began to glow. And when it's all done, when Moses was gone, Elijah was gone, and the cloud was gone, the Bible said they saw Jesus only. Looking away from, considering not the deadness of Sarah's womb. Considering not the staggering of my own body. Considering not the failures of yesterday. 
looking. And terror is reflected back with an open face until you're changed. You're changed. You're changed. I believe in holiness of external holiness from the hair to the toenails. I believe in all of it. But if that's all you got, you ain't nothing but a whitened sepulcher full of dead men's bones. Mm. If you ain't fell in love with him over and over and over and over again, I keep on falling in love with him over and over and over and over again. You know what? It's the most dangerous air the church has ever seen. Amen. It's the most dangerous time a church pre- a preacher's ever seen. Amen. Some great men have fallen into adultery and fallen down in the world. But you know why I ain't going to commit adultery? Because I keep falling in love again. Over and over and over and over and over and over again. Amen. Amen. We go from glory. Needing to preach and I want to shout. God, that's what salvation does for you. And sin does just the opposite. You hear me? Sin. Does just the opposite. We go from light to light, from strength to strength, from faith to faith, from victory to victory. But sin is a false glitter that starts out with a mirage for a promise and ends. Have you ever read it? Judas Iscariot finally did it. He sold him. The Bible said, when Jesus looked at him and said, What you do, do quickly. The Bible said, And Judas went out, and it was night. Sin will start with a false glitter, but it ends in gross darkness. This thing may start out with just a glimmer of light for yonder. But as you progress towards the light, as you walk in the light as He is in the light, you have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Ho, 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 ho. Hale koremahi shakarinda bohotaya. Glory to God, glory to God. From faith to faith are changed are changed my god man if you'll take a look at him it'll change you you see jesus christ must be the eternity of our time this is temporal this is just now but Jesus Christ is the eternity of my time. Rick, while I'm a preaching, turn to Acts 20 and find 24. Jesus Christ is the eternity for which I'm spending my time. That's what I traded my time for. I just traded my time for eternity. Oh, time. And then, oh, eternity. But you see, what we need to realize is our life is only as of 
as much value as there is Christ in us. That only, that and that only has eternal value which has been lived for Him and loved for Him. That's what Paul was talking about when he said, Whatsoever you do, do it all as unto the Lord. God, preacher, I don't care what you say. I ain't been in subjection to that jerk. Well, he's the jerk that you married. Ain't nobody's fault but you that you married that jerk. But, but, God said, in those things where He is a not direct violation of the written code of the Bible, you better be in subjection to Him. Because only that which He has lived and loved and suffered and gained for Him. When it's all said and done, when the fire is put to it, read, Rick, and I'll go on then. But none of these things move me. None of these things are important. What things? Imprisonments, sufferings, chains, being bound. Neither count I my life dear unto myself. Neither count I my life dear unto me. So that I might finish my course so that I might finish my course with joy. and do it with joy. You know what, folk? There's a lot of folks. They are doing it. But they act like they're mad over it. They're doing it. But they ain't got no joy in it. Paul said none of these things. What? The prophecies that if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound, you're going to be beaten. And the ministry. That I might finish with joy. This ministry. Which I have received. Which I have received. Of the Lord Jesus. Of the Lord Jesus. To testify. To testify. The gospel. The gospel. Of the grace of God. The grace of God. You see, if you ain't careful, you'll forget what it's all about. Here ain't another house. Here ain't another car. And I'll testify to you, I'm more afraid of debt right now than ever in my life. Amen. I can't tell you why, but I'm scared of debt. It is not God's perfect will for the wife to work outside the home. That's not the perfect will of God. Now, there's a lot of things that are dead. And we ain't going to never get them back. He wrote to one church and he said, Those things are dead. Strengthen those things that are ready to die. Right. Amen. And I realize that sometimes under certain circumstances, the wife has to work to help pay off the bills. But I don't know how many times. Now, I'm not talking to you if your children's grown and uh, that your husband uh, doesn't care and you want to find time to, outside the home to do more for the church. And, and uh, 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 the Bible talks about a wise woman. But 
Your first obligation is to your husband and then to your babies. And not in reverse, lady. Amen. I'm still talking about it. If we'll look on to Him, if we'll let Him be the sinner. I hope you don't quit me. Can I fix to preach some holiness to you? Amen. Paul said, I would that you older women would teach these younger girls how to be keepers at home. I've been counseling some of you about getting married and you don't know how to make gravy. Couldn't sew a button on. Got your mind on all, all, all that you think is it's a story, but we're going to play house. And I've heard folks tell me, yeah, but it's taking the pressure off of us. Okay, if you've got yourself in such a bind, you absolutely can't meet your bills on his paycheck. You work, but I ain't never seen it fail yet. Instead of paying the bills off, you come in with a new dress on. You buy a better car. You go deeper in debt. You know what you're doing? You're lying to yourself. You're lying to God. And you're getting out and under the covering. And after a while, when you come a-crying and the mistakes have been made, it's too late then. Let me tell you something, children. The baby don't need more toys. He needs mama. She needs mama. Only what's done? We're going to the judgment. And the fire is going to be put to what you are doing. And the wood... And the hay and the stubble is going to be burned up. Only, Paul said, I ain't counting nothing. I ain't counting nothing. Except, man, it's tight, but right in bond tonight. Amen. I love you. I love you, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you the truth. Hey, man, the reason we got one out of our two marriages in America divorcing at just about that rate in the church now is because women have sought them a career. You see, it's already been two generations messed up. I tell these, let me tell you, girls, I tell these young boys, if she's loud-mouthed and feisty and fussy and gripey and complaining and whiny, when you're just going together, it ain't going to get better. It's going to get worse. When go to her home when she ain't expecting you, say, Mama, can I go see your little girl's bedroom? Let me see how clean it is, because that's how clean your house is going to be. Well, I went to meddling, I guess, but I'm just going to do it a while. If you've got enough sense to comb your hair and wash your body and put a little deodorant on and come to church in a clean outfit, lady, you've got enough sense to clean your house if you ain't too sorry. And if you can't clean your house and do those other duties, let the other duties go. I'm still a preaching all. Oh, the only thing I count dear is what I've been called of God to do. And Paul said, I ain't going to be happy till I get it done. And I'm going to lay aside everything I've got to lay aside and do everything I've got to do if I can please Him. Amen. Amen. It may not be a seat you tonight, but I feel heaven running up and down the avenues of my soul. Oh! Looking unto Jesus. He's our example in the conflict. If you wish to be disappointed, just look around you at others. If you want to be downhearted, just take a long look at yourself. 
But if you wish to be encouraged and to know what victory is, spend your time looking at Jesus. For every one look, you look at others, put ten at him. For every one look, you look at yourself, look twenty at him. He endured. He endured the cross. Could I tell you they're going to have to be some enduring? It ain't going to be always a shout. You ain't going to come to church every night and run. Every time you sing, you won't feel heaven running over the avenues of your soul. Every time you pray, you won't feel like you've been cut away into the third heaven and heard things not lawful for a man to hear. Some of this, the big part of this, is taking up your cross and enduring. Not enjoying, but enduring. Now, when I use that word enjoy, I'm talking about the way the world looks at joy. For you see, the Bible said, He endured the cross, despising the shame. He endured such contradiction of sinners. Boy, we just can't hardly stand to be made fun of, can we? Long sleeves. Out here in the 90 degrees, when everything out here is naked. What are you doing wearing them long sleeves? Hall at school. Hope nobody don't notice I'm wearing a dress. Ain't got no makeup on. You know, we just can't hardly stand. He endured. He held out until he reached the goal. Can you imagine the King of Glory who could at any moment have called 12 legions of angels. Now, in 2 Kings, when the Assyrian army came down, one angel, just one angel, went down between dark and daylight, and when the sun came up, he had killed 185,000 fighting men. Just one angel. And here is he who could just bat his eyes, and 12 legions of the heaven's elite would stand. They who have stood and watched His glory and beheld Him crowned King of Kings watched Him crowned with a crown of thorns. They spit on Him. In the Greek, they... They spit on him until that stuff run, mingled with his sweat and blood and stink. He endured such contradiction of sinners. You know why? Hmm. He allowed himself to be despised, put to shame of sinners. And then me and you can't feel for God. We can't keep the victory over the lust in our flesh, over the pride of our lives. We ain't willing to endure a little hardness. And if we have to, we come to church and make sure everybody knows it. Yeah. Oh, I'm too bad off tonight, man. I won't lie. Hey, just move me if you can, preacher. Yeah. Mr. Matthew, if 
the truth was told a lot of times. If, if, if the Lord came down and said, What's the matter with you? And you told the truth, you said, I'm a throwing a temper tantrum on God because I didn't get my way. I'm mad. Come on. I'm here, but it's only because I don't want to be made fun of tomorrow and everybody ring on the phone off the hook. I'd stay home tonight if I'd have done what I wanted to, but I'm here. But I know, Brother Gavin, would call tomorrow. So what's the matter with you? Now I'd have to tell him, well, she burnt the cornbread. Yeah. He endured. We need to take a look at him again until we see who he is and what he did. While the disciples was going to the upper room uh, to have supper, there's a fussing. And you know what there's a fussing about? When we get to be in the kingdom, big boy, I'm going to be over you. When we sit down, I'm going to be closer to him than you are. You're going to wait on me when we get there. And that night when they went into the room, Jesus sat them down. The Master Himself sat them down. The mortal. Poured some water in a basin. Girded Himself with a towel. And began to wash their feet. The job, the foot washing was the lowest job of the lowest servant in the household. Because they, if they wasn't barefooted, they wore sandals. They went through the streets of Jerusalem where that the, the storm sewers was literally the, the sewers. The filth of all the city poured in the streets. And you walk into the streets. And that's why when you went to somebody's house, they offered you a place to wash your feet. Because they, you needed your feet washed. And Jesus washed their feet. And he said to them, and I got to hurry. He said, you know what I'm doing? He said, I'm leaving you an example. This is how you ought to act. Oh, my God. The reason for all this enduring, he who for the joy that was set before him, If heaven, oh God, I've told you before, there was a there was a wicked man, a mean man, a vile man, a murderer, a cold-blooded murderer, who was finally caught up and brought before the magistrates of England, and the high courts condemned him on a certain day to be executed. And on that morning. They sent an old, tarred Anglin bishop. An old man came to lead him to the gallows. And his name was Charlie Mason. And he began to read from the Bible. And this man on his way to the gallows stopped this preacher, this priest, and he said, If I believed what you are reading to be true. And I had your opportunity. Though all of England was broken glass. And I must go upon my bare feet. I would walk. Yea, I would crawl till every man, woman, boy, and girl of England had heard what you're preaching. You're preaching. What a rebuke. What a rebuke to me. If it is true, and I believe it is, we're standing on the verge of the coming of the Lord. And millions upon millions upon millions are going to die lost and go to hell. While we worry and plot and strive and maneuver and play our silly games. He endured because he knew that there was a joy after a while. You see, what Charlie Mason was saying was, if there is really a heaven, and I can really go there, then I, if I had to lay down and crawl, 
the rest of the way. If I, can, if I never, ever, ever feel the blessing of God in my soul again, if all that I know from here on out is buffeting, persecution, and shame, if you've ever seen heaven, I still say you don't backslide overnight if you've ever really seen Him. If you've ever really seen Him, there's more to the struggle. It's not easy for you to sin. You may sin. You may walk over it. You may break out of it, but you have to struggle to do it because the constraints of love will hold you if you've ever seen Him. Jesus held on because He knew that after a while He'd be able to straighten up His old broken head and stiffen His old broken body and cry with a loud voice, It is finished! And after a while, after a while, if we'll hang on, Davy, we'll be able to say, whether it be on a deathbed or changing worlds in the translation, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. I have finished my course. I have run the race. I have endured. Help up. We'll be worth the journey when we get there. My God, man, you forgot what it's all about. The bottom line is, heaven bound, heaven bound, ain't got long to stay here. The way it gets hard on you, and you're bowed down, and the devil says, why don't you quit? Why don't you quit? What do you say? No way. No way. Heaven bound. Heaven bound. Heaven bound. Got you can't take no more of this. What do you say? Heaven bound. <laughs> it don't matter no way. <laughs> Amen. Great God. We're heaven bound. Heaven bound. Heaven bound. Heaven bound. That hurt. Why don't you quit? Heaven bound. Ain't got a long stay here. Heaven bound. Heaven bound. Ain't got a long stay here. They grabbed old Stephen. And they threw him over the field. The rocks began to hit him. He said, oh, heaven bound. Heaven bound. Ain't got a long stay here. Father! Forgive them. They don't know what they do. I see Jesus standing at the Father's right hand. I see Jesus yonder in the glory land. He endured. He endured. Despising the shame. The chastening, the rebuking, the whippings. If the relationship's right, I've had God, I, I've, I've got down, I've got desperate. Maybe you ain't. I've got desperate, and I've said, God, speak to me, speak to me, even if it's a rebuke. Just let me know I'm still in the family. God, speak to me. If I did a whooping, give me a good whooping. Because I know when the whooping's over. There'll be a blessing. You see, he's our example of unwavering hope. Jesus did not allow himself to be turned aside from the future for anything connected. What did he say? What did he say? Oh, I got to hurry. That clock's are flying. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest a root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or 
profane person like Esau. When you give in to your passion and sell your birthright in fornication, it's because you got distracted from the eternal. You know what? Anne's favorite time of the year is the spring. I guess her favorite message I ever preached is one on springtime. I preached here some time ago. But you know what happens in the springtime? The earth, in its turning, gets closer to the sun. The sun begins to shine on it longer. And it begins to get warmer. Holy, 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 holy. You feel cold in your soul. You feel a drawing of the world. You need to come and stand in the presence of the sun. And just look at the sun. Who was that ancient Greek one who thought he was born? His entire mission in life was to look at the sun. To behold the beauty of the sun. Crazy. Yeah. Dedicated. Absolutely. But my main objective, my main objective is to look at the sun until from His glory I become changed. And then I come down off the mountain and you look at me and you see the glory. And you say, my God, he's been with Jesus. My God, he's been with the Lord. And you, and you, and you slip off somewhere and say, Lord, I'm getting cold in my soul. Would you turn the sun on me a while? I want to see you. Lord, let me catch a vision of heaven again. Drop me a few handfuls on purpose. Oh, glory. Mm, hallelujah. Oh, 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 glory. My God. My God, forget Esau, Esau, in a few days, just a few days. And beans going to make you sick. In a few days, you're going to think, I hate this. I've said time and time again, would you listen to me? I, I've been here a while. I've listened to people. I thought it's all I wanted. I thought it's everything I could long for. But I hate it. I hate what I am. I hate what I've done. It wasn't the party I thought it was going to be. One man testified of his adulterous affair. He said, She chased me. And at first, it merely infatuated me that somebody else could be concerned. And innocently, I flirted. We talked about ordinary things. Then she wound herself into my affections and told me her pitiful story. And I found something awakening in me. And something said, you better run to the city of refuge. You better run. You better run to the light. This thing is darkness. You better run to the light. But oh, he lingered. And he lingered until one day it was too late. And he said, my God, preacher, before the act of adultery had ever been consummated and completed, I hated her. It made me sick. And said, then I hated me. And he said, I still do. I hate me. Every time he shaves, he sees that weak person, a quitter. 
me ask you, how does a backslider live with himself? How do you shave in the morning knowing that you are weak, that you are a failure? My God, it's time you come to yourself. In the end, oh, the prodigal had him a time for a while. Oh, yes, he enjoyed them heartaches for a while. Yeah, it was pleasure in sin for a while. But the most degraded thing, the most hated thing that a Jew could do was touch swine's flesh. It was an abomination of God. We see this once proud Jew going to that Gentile heathen. And you got a job for me? And he said, the devil said, have I got a job for you? Feed the hogs. Get down among them swine where it stinks. And pour the slop out to them. Feed them. But I'm hungry. When do I eat? Eat with the hogs. That's what you are. You know what? The reason a lot of people are still hanging around in church and still fighting battles is because they never did recognize they was a hog. Only a hog or a dog would have done like some of us did. But thank God one day he come to himself and said, I'm going back to my father's house. And he climbed out of the hog pen. Amen. And left the hogs behind and went back to his father's house. Heaven will be worth the journey. But it wasn't so with Esau. For you know how that afterward... The devil's telling you, go ahead. Go ahead. You can get back to God. It ain't really that close anyway. Go ahead. But I'm telling you, if you don't look to Jesus, look past that thing's distracting you, you get your eyes on Jesus again, you'll find yourself one of these days profane. could remember was I hate portage. I hate beans. One man drove up in my yard and he looked and he said, I hate sex. I lost my wife for this. I hate it. I said, sure you do. There is a line unseen by men drawn in every man's path. And afterwards, and afterwards, when you come back screaming and crying, you see, that one may get back because they ain't set under this kind of preaching. Did you know there's been people that's actually said, I wish I didn't know what I know. Can you imagine that? Wanting to commit sin so bad, I wish I didn't know what I know. Till I could find some relief. There's no relief for the flesh. Sin does not satisfy. Will you hear me? Sin does not satisfy. It ain't what it looks like it is. My God, I'm a preaching tonight. And I feel like I'm a walking between the living and the dead. Oh, my God. Oh my God, looking unto Jesus.